Think back to the game you played with Steve. You know, the one where you lost $20 because the coin came up ahead 60 out of 100 flips. Remember that the first time you played with Steve 10 times, the coin came up ahead 6 out of 10 times. You didn't get too suspicious because if Steve was honest, like you assumed him to be, and was using a fair coin, it wouldn't be too surprising to get 6 out of 10 heads. 6 isn't that far from 5, what you would have expected from probability theory. But were you making a mistake? In the end, it turned out that Steve was taking you for a ride, and you were naively going along because you hadn't noticed anything too unusual. Suppose that after your incident with Steve, you decide to play the same game with your other friend, Arlene. I guess you hadn't really learned your lesson with Steve. You and Arlene play 10 times and are both surprised when the coin comes up heads 9 out of 10 times. The chances of there being 9 or 10 heads in a sequence of 10 coin flips is rather small, about 1%. After your encounter with Steve, you start to wonder whether everyone's a cheat. But you know that Arlene is a very innocent, sweet, and honest person. Surely she isn't cheating. Would you be making a mistake to accuse her of cheating based on the results of 9 heads and 10 flips? In this session, we're going to be discussing statistical errors. Suppose that we're testing a well for arsenic to see if it's safe. Water is safe for agricultural use if it has no more than 8 parts per billion of arsenic. A random sample of 37 cups of well water had a mean of 7.3 parts per billion arsenic. The farmer running the test calculated a test statistic of t equals negative 2.24 with a one-sided p-value of 2%, and he concludes that the water is safe for the crops. Now, what does the sampling distribution tell us? Each time the farmer performs a study like this one, the sample mean is going to be kind of close to the population mean, but it won't be exactly the same as the population mean. The sampling distribution tells us how likely it is to get any particular value for the sample mean in a given study. It's most likely going to be close to the population mean, and it's less likely, but still possible, to be far away from the population mean. Now, suppose that the null hypothesis really is true, and the water is contaminated. How often would you expect to get a sample statistic of 0.7 parts per billion or more away from the contamination level of 8 parts per billion? Suppose you're doing a statistical test, and by chance, your sample statistic is negative 2.24. Remember, in this hypothetical situation, the null hypothesis really is true, and even when the null hypothesis is true, there's some chance of getting a large sample statistic. What would you conclude? Would you have a correct conclusion? Even though the null hypothesis was true, you would think that you had evidence against it because your sample just happened to be a bit unusual. In statistical inference, there is always a chance that you draw an incorrect conclusion. Think back to our discussion of confidence intervals. We said that a sample statistic was a point estimate, or the best guess for a population parameter. But we know that the sample statistics are not exactly the same as a population parameter. There's some variability in the sample statistic from study to study. And this variability, how far off the point estimate is from the population parameter on average, may be greater for some studies, like those with small sample sizes, than for other studies. We said that we could use a confidence interval to reflect the uncertainty or the potential variability in our estimate. That is, we provided a range of probable values for the population parameter based on the results from our study. We chose a confidence level for this interval, say 95%, which basically meant how often confidence intervals would actually include the population parameter. That is, about 95% of the time that you construct a 95% confidence interval, the interval would actually contain the population parameter. But on the other hand, about 5% of the time you construct such a confidence interval, the population parameter will be outside the interval. Simply due to random variation in the sample, your sample statistic happens to be kind of far away from the population parameter. In statistical tests, we make a similar choice. Instead of calling it a confidence level, we call it a significance level. This is the maximum p-value that you decided that you can have and still reject the null hypothesis. Or in other words, it's the least unusual you're willing to go and still call the results unusual. We've been using 0.05 for our significance level. That is, we decided that the results were unusual when the p-value was less than 0.05. But when the null hypothesis is actually true, we expect to get a p-value less than 0.05 about 5% of the time, just by random variation. But we always decide that the null hypothesis is false if the p-value is less than 0.05. This means that sometimes you'll make the wrong decision, 
it will look like the null hypothesis is false when actually it's true. This is one kind of mistake in statistical testing, thinking that the null hypothesis is false when really it's true. In statistics, we give this kind of error a name. It's a terrible name in my opinion, but it's the name people use. This is called type 1 error. Type 1 error is deciding to reject the null hypothesis, that is saying that the null hypothesis is false when actually it's true. For example, German shepherds have a very keen sense of smell, which is why they're often used to sniff out explosives in public places. A researcher wondered whether German shepherds could also be trained to detect cancer by sniffing human breath. The researcher trains a few dogs and asks you to run an experiment. Suppose that in reality, the dogs can't tell the difference between cancerous and non-cancerous breath. By chance, when you run your study, you get a p-value of 0.04. Even though they can't tell the difference, you'll get a, a p-value this small about 4% of the time. I guess you were just unlucky this time. Because the p-value is small, you decide that the dogs can tell the difference, but this really isn't true. You've made the wrong decision. You rejected the null hypothesis of no difference when it was actually true. This is a type 1 error. There's a second kind of statistical error that's the complement of type 1 error. Can you guess what it's called? Type 2 error is deciding not to reject the null hypothesis when actually it's false. For example, suppose that women really do work some number of hours per week different than 40. But your study had too small of a sample, so you can't tell the difference between how much they really work and 40. The p-value is large, so you decide that you don't have evidence that they work anything but 40 hours a week on average. You do not reject the null hypothesis when really you should have. This is a type 2 error. You can think of type 1 and type 2 error as the mistakes you could make in a criminal trial. Either the defendant really is guilty, or he's actually innocent. If you convict a truly guilty man, or acquit a truly innocent man, the court has made the right decision and justice has been served. But the courts aren't perfect, and sometimes an innocent man gets convicted, or a guilty man gets off scot-free. If you think of the null hypothesis as the hypothesis of innocence, a type 1 error is like convicting an innocent man, and a type 2 error is like acquitting a guilty man. Now, ideally, you'd like to minimize the number of errors you make. To limit type 1 error, you could set a more stringent cutoff. Instead of looking for p less than 0.05, you could look for p less than 0.01, which means you'd expect to see small p-values only 1% of the time when the null hypothesis is true, instead of 5%. But unfortunately, if you decrease your chances of a type 1 error, you increase your chances of a type 2 error, and vice versa. So we have to live with some kind of happy balance between the two. As I mentioned earlier, the significance level is an indication of how unusual the results would have to be under the null hypothesis for you to start questioning whether the null hypothesis really is true. How many heads do you have to get in a row before you wonder if you have a fair coin? Often people call these unusual results statistically significant. By this, they mean that the results would have been so unusual if the null hypothesis were true that the results provide significant statistical evidence against the possibility of the null hypothesis. But it's important to note that the statistical significance may not be the same thing as practical significance. Let's look at an example. The general social survey asks, I'm going to show you a seven point scale on which the political views that people might hold are arranged from extremely liberal, point one, to extremely conservative, point seven. Where do you place yourself on this scale? A value of 4.0 corresponds to moderate. For a sample of 4,333 subjects, the mean value they reported was 4.12 with a standard deviation of 1.41. Suppose we want to know if people are, on average, different than moderate. The null hypothesis is that the mean response that people give is 4.0. That corresponds to moderate. And the alternative hypothesis is that the population mean is different than 4.0. When we compute our test statistic, we get t equals 5.6. And we can compute a p-value of 0.0000002.
That's one in 50 million. Our conclusion is we're going to reject the null hypothesis. Average political views are different than moderate. What does that p-value represent again? If people's political views were actually moderate, then only one out of 50 million studies like this one would find a sample mean that was so hugely different than moderate. This p-value is incredibly small, which means that if the average political view really were moderate, it would be incredibly unlikely to have a sample statistic so far away from moderate. But wait, how far away was the sample mean from moderate? Moderate was 4.0, and the sample mean was 4.12. What do those numbers mean? Well, 1 is liberal, 7 is conservative. Is 4.12 really that far away from moderate? Not really. Although we had overwhelming statistical evidence that the average political view is different from moderate, the size of the difference is really not that large, practically speaking. Statistical significance is not the same thing as practical significance. Statistically different does not necessarily mean practically different. Statistical significance is important for drawing conclusions about quantitative data, but just as we saw from our investigation of what do the numbers mean, the importance of those conclusions comes from somewhere beyond the numbers, in the realm of social structures and values. In a statistical test, we're looking for evidence that suggests that the null hypothesis isn't true, to convict the null hypothesis, so to speak. But, as we said before, there's always a chance that we make a mistake when we conduct our statistical test. Usually, we're thinking about cases in which the null hypothesis is true. That's what we assume for the sake of argument at the start of all of our statistical tests. But let's think for a moment about all those times when the null hypothesis isn't true. The coin really is weighted, or the well really is poisoned. In these cases, we said that type 2 error is when we fail to recognize these facts. Even though the coin is weighted, we remain unsuspicious. Even though the well is poisoned, we, we remain in perilous ignorance. But that's a rather negative view on the world now, isn't it? Instead of thinking about how often we make a mistake, we can think about how likely we are to get the answer correct. This is called statistical power. Statistical power is the probability of correctly deciding to reject the null hypothesis. Or put another way, the probability of correctly deciding to accept the alternative hypothesis. Statistical power is the opposite of type 2 error. If the defendant really is guilty, statistical power is how often the courts will get it right and send him to jail. Maximizing power is important for two reasons. First, if we're really more interested in the alternative hypothesis than the null hypothesis, we want to prove that Steve is cheating after all. We need to maximize power so that we maximize our chances of finding unusual results. Second, even if we're really more interested in the null hypothesis, suppose we really hope to find that men and women have similar salaries on average, we don't want someone to accuse us of remaining in blissful ignorance with the null hypothesis just because we didn't look hard enough for unusual results. It took a hundred coin flips to catch the conniving Steve, ten just wasn't enough. There are several factors that influence statistical power, but the big one that researchers generally have the most control over is the sample size. The larger the sample, the greater the statistical power. But there are usually costs to increasing the sample size. Think about a study in which you have to pay your subjects 100 bucks each to participate. So generally, researchers have to balance the costs with the desire for power when planning a study.